we're going to open with a word of prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We thank thee for this day and for your word. And we pray for the viewers that they will, by your Holy Spirit, open your word and search the scriptures daily whether these things are so like the Bereans of old. You've promised to sanctify us through thy truth. Thy word is truth. We pray for the Holy Spirit to guide us into thy truth to bring you all the glory, the praise, the honor, and the blessing. All the credit goes to the man in linen, who is our great high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Teach us from your word, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Hello friends and welcome back to Five Agendas. Now, um, we did some editing of the videos that we've got up there so far. We've provided links that are either the help charts or the thought papers, so when you view the video, you can click on the links to um, go more in depth into the um, the various help charts and thought papers to study these things more. Now, what I want to say first before we get into the um, chart that will be from the September 2016 thought paper is this. To deny these two immutable things is denying the man in linen. It's denying Christ, our great high priest, after the order of Melchizedek. And when you do that, you have a false Christ, which is what the false, another gospel, leads to. Because these two immutable things are what the man in linen, his offering of necessity, and his necessary cleansing is all about. Okay. So to, to deny this, a final atonement, a dual atonement, means you have no great high priest. And when you have no, no great high priest, there's no one left to cleanse you. And the text that uh, I presented in the margin here of this thought paper was from John 8, 24, which says, I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins, for if you believe not that I am, ye shall die in your sins. No great high priest, no one to cleanse you. Okay? So, but 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. To deny these two things is denying Christ and the man in linen. But Paul in Hebrews 4.14 says that we have a great high priest and in 5.10 He's after the order of Melchizedek. So how long halt ye between two opinions? It's time to accept the everlasting gospel. The two immutable things, which is what the two immutable things are, the everlasting gospel, the man in linen, and so you can receive the latter rain, okay? So, as we've um, discussed previously, what does ministering the benefits from the uh, questions on doctrine and seven damas believe mean? What does ministering the benefits mean? 
Now, what you're probably realizing, or going to realize, is that these two immutable things are the light of rain. It's the everlasting gospel. Because what happened on the day of Pentecost was the early rain, and it concerned, it followed his offering of necessity. So the latter rain follows his necessary cleansing, and when that began. But what does ministering the benefits mean? Seeing that the Bible is saying there is a dual or final atonement, and the majority, the crowd, are saying there is no final dual atonement. It's um, ministering the benefits. It's like it's saying nothing. Because it's not Bible. It's not truth. It's not what the two immutable things are saying. And so, essentially, it's, it's picturing him up there with nothing to do and that he's just sitting around twiddling his fingers. No! He's not. Because in fact, Hebrews 7, 25 says, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. It's for us. That does not convey a twist finished, twas all finished at the cross, no dual atonement theology. He's ever living to make intercession for us. Now, everyone out there is saying, you know, we're preaching the full gospel. We're preaching the gospel, the good news, and so forth. But what you're seeing with this is that there's a huge amount of truth missing. The everlasting gospel. It's, it's missing from these messages that you hear out there on the radio, on television, and papers from the pulpit because it's totally ignoring the second immutable. Okay? And so what that basically means is that these messages are a false gospel, another gospel, because it's not what Paul was preaching. The everlasting gospel is summed up in the book of Hebrews and Paul saying two immutable things to only concentrate on one aspect of it and, and ignore and denigrate and deny everything else is a false gospel. Now, as we continue explaining the chart from this thought paper, now that you're a little more familiar with the two immutable things, we have pictures describing what the two immutable things are. Here's the first immutable. The second immutable, and that can be summed up as the everlasting gospel, summarized in the book of Hebrews, two immutable things, and for the first immutable, remember Psalms 2-7, I will declare the decree, thou art my son, and the reason why he became a son was because it was of necessity that this man have someone else to offer, okay? And the reason why he became a great high priest, in that sworn oath, the Lord has sworn and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, is what Hebrews 5, 5, uh, 5 and 6 are all about. A decreed son to come for the offering of necessity, a sworn by an oath, great high priest to come and be as our great high priest. Because following the cross, he went back to heaven. He was inaugurated as our great high priest and ministered a daily, as the type showed, a daily atonement of forgiveness. Because Hebrews 1 says, when he sat down, he purged our sins. Okay? So our great high priest, a necessary cleansing of heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices. And so Hebrews 9.23 is the second immutable, a necessary cleansing. Hebrews 8.3 is the first immutable, the offering of necessity. And it's all 
based on this key text there in Hebrews 6.18 that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation, the fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Which hope? And since I've learned these things for the first time in my life, I actually have a hope. It's very special. Which hope we have is an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil Whither the forerunner, see, it points you to our great high priest, is for us entered, even Jesus, made in high priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. Two immutable things. The offering of necessity, the necessary cleansing. The reason why he became a son, the reason why he became our great high priest. Now, what we want to show you is how these two immutable things line up with ancient Israel's feasts. Now one thing you need to know is that there was the spring feast of Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and Pentecost. Those were the spring feasts. The fall feasts were trumpets, day of atonement, and tabernacles. And a huge point, these and especially the Day of Atonement, which means the Atonement was not finished at the cross. The Day of Atonement, in the type, was never celebrated, it was never kept in the spring, at the time of Passover, where Christ fulfilled the Passover as our Passover Lamb, as 1 Corinthians shows. He was our Passover Lamb. That was a spring feast. Not a fall feast. The fall feast didn't come later until the uh, later on in the year, in the fall of the year. And these were metaphors for these were taken, uh, these took place and Christ fulfilled them at the beginning of the gospel age, the spring. These are taking place at the end, the end of the ages. And where we are right here is on the sixth feast, Day of Atonement. So what we have here is the Passover links you to the first immutable, his offering of necessity, our Passover lamb. Okay, And the Day of Atonement, the sixth feast in the fall, links you to the second immutable thing, the Day of Atonement, when Christ began his final atonement ministration when the 2300 years were fulfilled in Daniel 8.14 and 1844. So, the antitypical fulfillment of Passover was Christ crucified in 31 AD and that is from Daniel 9.27. It was prophesied. He was to be cut off in the midst of the week. This he did once when he offered up himself. It was once offered the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. The offering, not the atonement again. One sacrifice, one offering. And the antitypical application of the Day of Atonement feast was the commencement of the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary, as we just spoke about, which says in Hebrews 9.26, Now once. Now once. In the end of the world. And that was not at the time of Passover, in 31 AD. He hath appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. This was of necessity. His blood to minister for our cleansing during this antitypical day of this day of atonement. This final atonement. So what we see is, as we'll be discussing in a future chart that we've um, produced was that we have Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, feast of weeks, feast of trumpets, day of atonement, feast of tabernacles. Christ fulfilled Passover from 1 Corinthians 5 7. He was our Passover, our Passover lamb. Christ's burial, he condemned sin, the leaven in the flesh. He was not suffered to seek corruption, so he fulfilled unleavened bread, check mark. First fruits, Christ's resurrection, Christ the firstfruits, firstborn from the dead, and the text, 
fulfilled, Feast of Weeks, a spiritual harvest by Christ of about 3,000 souls to the new and living way by the sending of His Holy Spirit. He fulfilled that. The Feast of Trumpets. Now here's your fall feast. These were the spring feasts. He fulfilled those in 31 AD. The cross and thereafter through His death, burial, resurrection and the uh, the Pentecost, the spiritual harvest, but the fall feast, there was a trumpet call, and that's what the seventh month movement was all about. It was a loud voice, it alerted the, the people about the coming ministration, although they understood that it was Christ's coming, and so there was that disappointment, but it was actually an alert, a trumpet call, alerting us to the ministration of Christ, our great high priest, in the heavenly sanctuary. And then came the Day of Atonement, which is what Daniel 8, 14 is all about. It's a final atonement, necessary cleansing, because it said unto 2300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And the important thing for us is it's a people. It's where He's going to cleanse us so we can overcome as He overcame. The filthy garments removed, He closes, closes with the robes of His own righteousness. And that's in the process right now. And that, and the uh, Feast of Tabernacles, that takes place when it will be fulfilled. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and He will dwell with them, and the saints possess the kingdom. Here we are, right here in time. Now, Passover, Day of Atonement. Metaphors for how Christ was going to fulfill the feast, antitypically, because He said... I have not come to destroy the law of the prophets, but to fulfill. Okay, he started fulfilling them. His death, his burial, his resurrection, the day of Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and then came eight, uh, the 1840s. There was the trumpet call alerting us. 1844, the day of atonement. And again, this in the type was never... There was no sacrifice. There was no observance of this during the time of the Passover. So what is this essentially telling us? This had to take place, and then this. In the order it was given in the type. Because Hebrews 8, 5, again, the priest served unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. Okay? Now, there's just some points that we're going to go through as we just explain there's going to be a link below this video for this chart and the thought paper and some other helps, as I said, where you can pull this up, read it, study it. So, the third point, the first immutable, it relates to that first ministration, the necessity of the once-for-all sacrifice on the cross in 31 AD, which necessitated the first decree, the first immutable thing, Thou art my Son, and that involves both the Godhead and the Incarnation of Christ. This is what the mystery of godliness okay, is all about. Which says, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Okay, so you're first immutable and crossing over to the second column. We're comparing for the third point. The second immutable relates to the second ministration. The necessary. Oh, but everybody's saying, they're basically saying it's not necessary. But Hebrews 9.23 says, there is a necessary cleansing. Okay? His high priestly ministration commenced in 1844 A.D. It necessitated the second decree, the sworn oath, the second immutable thing, that our priest for order after the order of Melchizedek. It involves a necessary cleansing. And this is what resolves the sin problem in our sinful flesh. And that takes place now once in the end of the world. This is what the mystery among the Gentiles is all about. Because the ultimate result and goal of that is Christ in you. The hope of glory. We don't, we don't have to die in our sins. We don't have to continue a sin and repent, sin and repent cycle. 
there is no once saved, always saved. Our salvation is in Christ. And it's through the two immutable things. Now, what you see over here, the first immutable, in context, with Hebrews 1.3, when he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And the second immutable is in the context of Hebrews 9.23. Necessary, the patterns of things, those earthly things had to be cleansed. But the heaven of, of things in the, that should be, patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. How could it all have been finished at the cross when Hebrews 9.23 is saying the heavenly things have to be cleansed with better sacrifices than the blood of bulls and goats. Okay? First immutable, first immutable, excuse me, relates the council of peace as we talked about in prior videos. And that council decreed thou art my son. It was between the two of them was that the son should of necessity offer himself for man's redemption to make atonement or reconciliation with him. And the second decree, the Council of Peace, the oath, again, thou art a priest forever. It was between the two of them, was for the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary and of a peculiar people. And as Zechariah 3.8 says, it actually calls these people that are going to have Christ in them, the hope of glory, it calls them men wondered at. Okay? Now, for the sixth point, the early reign followed the ministration which was of necessity, the cross. That was the early, the early reign in 31 AD. That old covenant pointed to the first immutable thing and toward the second immutable thing. But for the second, the latter reign. We are actually in the time of the latter reign. It followed the ministration which was, of, which was necessary. The commencement of the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary following the fulfillment of the 2300 years in 1844. 1844, locked in because of Daniel 8.14. Okay? We're in the time of that latter rain. And that's what Daniel 12.12 12 is all about. There's a blessing. Blessed is he that comes to the 13.35. And for the last point, the necessity of Christ's cross opened the way for that daily, that daily ministration because after the cross, when he went to heaven and it was inaugurated as our great high priest, okay, he commenced that daily, antitypical daily ministration that the type foreshadowed. It was an atonement of forgiveness. And that went until the time that the yearly Day of Atonement, antitypical Day of Atonement, began. Okay, and that's what Daniel 8, 14 is all about. But during that time between, while the uh, daily, Christ's daily ministration was going on, before the yearly began, remember, Daniel 8 and 12 says that there was to be 1290 years that the little horn was to trod that down, that daily ministration. Because remember the question, until when, how long, admite, shall be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation by the little horn against it? Well, the answer was, unto 2,300 days. And that's why we have the 2300 and the 1290 terminating at the same time that this began. Okay? Uh... So that daily ministration, it was pitched in Leviticus 4 to commence. Once Christ returned to his Father, was inaugurated as our great high priest after the order of Melchizedek. This ran from 31 AD to 1844, during which time the daily, the Tamid, the true Tamid, which wasn't paganism, elsewise, because of the, the context of what Daniel 8 was sharing, was that that daily was truth. But if the daily is paganism, then you have to say that the daily was, paganism was the truth. Paganism is not the truth. Christ's high priestly administration is the truth. It's a reconciliation for the sins of the people. That's what the type portrayed. 
It was prior to 1844, and that one was taken away by the Little Horn. That first atonement ministration coincides with the spring feast being fulfilled by Christ in the antitype, which is what those spring feasts were, all fulfilled. Now he's working on the sixth. Okay? The necessary high priestly ministration of Christ, it commenced in 1844 because the Bible says so. There was to be 2300 days or years using the day for year key that we were given and it had to be 2300 years after the, the decree for the commencement to rebuild and restore Jerusalem. That has been proven historically in 457 BC. Okay? Uh, it was typified by the yearly administration. See this? That's the antitype of what that type yearly administration in Leviticus 16 was all about. It revealed a cleansing and not just ministering the benefits, ministering the virtues. It's a cleansing. It's much, much more, and it's much, much more important. Please don't deny it. Our, our eternal salvation is involved if we do. Um, a cleansing and putting away of sin by the sacrifice of himself, as Hebrews 9.26 shows, now once in the end of the world, that second atonement ministration course coincides with the fall feast, wherein we find ourselves living during the ministration of Christ's antitypical day of atonement. And we'll get back to this another time. Thank you very much for watching. We'll see you soon.